Good job. Hi, Carolyn and Pat, and I'm from the Homelessness Task Force. And the task force has been trying to um, familiarize the community with the unhoused, that there's a tendency to not fully understand the people who've lost their housing or what it's like to be unhoused. And so we've done three presentations so far. And so now it's time to take a look at what are the options that are available. So we've invited Sue and Samantha to tell us what Burlington has done in this regard. So now I'll turn it over to them. Great. Hi everyone, good evening. Uh, my name is Samantha Dunn. I work uh, for the City of Burlington in the Community and Economic Development Office. Um, and I work in that office with Sarah Russell, who was supposed to be here. You see her name up on the slide. Um, she was not able to attend suddenly for um, a family reason. She was hired by the City of Burlington a year ago as a special assistant to end homelessness. So that is a new um, position at the city. And then um, with my colleague, Sue Cobb, um, who was a project management consultant on this specific project in Burlington, so helped us actually implement uh, the ideas and get it built. Um, so I have a bunch of slides that I'm gonna walk through to sort of lay out the process that the city went through to develop a new um, emergency shelter community. Um, I have, a, Sarah was gonna talk a little bit more about um, the shelter has been operating since February 8th. Um, so she's more involved in, the, in that, in the operations, but we've, I've got the information from her slides and um, all, this presentation I can, it is available electronically. I put my email at the end um, so people can get it and email me questions. You're welcome to interrupt me as I'm going through the slides and ask questions as well. So chow or put your hand up. Um, so what, are, are most people here, are you familiar with the Elmwood Shelter community? Do most folks know what it is? Um, this first slide, and I'm gonna back up the history a little bit, but this first slide is kind of showing what the entire community is, and you can see this was a city-owned uh, parking lot with parking meters and leased parking spaces um, the, in a pretty dense neighborhood in the old north end of Burlington, just a couple of blocks um, up from the end of the top of Church Street. Um, and the community includes 30 individual shelters, um, five of the shelters were manufactured by a local um, company called Up and This, and 25 of them came from pallet shelters, um, which you've likely heard of uh, in the news. These are shelters that have been developed by a company in, out on the west coast of Washington um, that come flat packed and are erected uh, very quickly, and they have a lot of um, shelter communities around the country. Um, in addition to the 30 shelters, we have um, the bathhouse. Um, so this was a modular building. It has six full bathrooms in it, two of them um, fully accessible um, and with solar panels on the roof. And then a community building that has offices for staff and services, laundry, um, two additional bathrooms, a kitchen, and then in community gathering spaces where all the food is distributed and services happen. And the two um, community buildings were um, constructed off-site by a company called KBS Builders um, in Paris, Maine, uh, and trailered to truck to the site. Um, and the idea in the city of Burlington is this is meant to be a temporary solution. We have permits to operate um, this on site just for three years. So we were really working to um, put infrastructure just on top and be able to reuse it in other places in the future. Hey, Samantha, how many, yes. uh, how many uh, resident occupancy do you have? There's 35 occupants, so there's 30 shelters. Five of them accommodate two mm -hmm. people at their own choice. Okay. Um, the pallet shelters are designed so you can add a second bed. Yeah. Um, we have had higher demand for those double occupancy than we anticipated. Um, and we've looked into adding um, more doubles, but it requires opening up our zoning current, which I'll talk about a little bit, but not, we're not gonna do that. Thank you. <laughs> On that question, yeah. um, is, um, uh, is it going to be at all possible to scale up um, to the 3,000 plus that this, you're dealing with? This site cannot scale up. This site is at capacity, yeah. 
Well, I mean, uh, how about uh, getting hand, your hands on a female crevice? Um, Is there any left from Katrina? We haven't been, I haven't been looking at that, no. Um, so the, what this slide is a um, 10 point action plan that came out of the mayor's office in December of 2021. Um, a 10 point action plan to ensure housing as a human right in the city of Burlington. And you can see the fifth bullet here was to invest in this kind of um, new shelter and in a new shelter model um, based on a low barrier public health um, you know, services on site model. Um, this also uh, action plan included creating the position of Sarah Russell, the special assistant to end homelessness, um, and a wide range of um, zoning changes um, that are, we've also been moving through the city to um, either create uh, more density than exists or to um, make it possible to build housing in some um, places where housing was not allowed previously. So those things are coming along a little bit more slowly. And Samantha, on that, um, yes. that first bullet talked about some financials. And if you go back to the first yes. overview, that 35 occupancy unit, yes. is that a million bucks, two million bucks? I'm gonna get to, I have okay. a detailed budget for you because I know people wanna know about this. Um, this is a timeline. So it starts with that 10 point action plan. I was saying in December that announcement um, it actually really starts a month or two before my first uh, week on the job at the city of Burlington, um, where people might have heard the Sears Lane, encamp which was an um, encampment that was um, not organized, didn't have public health services, was shut down by the city. Um, it was very controversial because people felt like that was a community that they had in a place. And as that was shutting, it was saying, what are we gonna, what is the alternative that we're going to provide? All of the residents of the Sears Lane encampment, because the motel program was still happening and there were lots of resources were able to, uh, we were able to get them into shelter, but it was recognized that there was a need for additional shelter within the city of Burlington. So, Started a little bit before December. I made my first call to Pallet, I think my second week um, on the job, just starting to understand what our options were. Um, and then you can see in February, our city council um, approved this $3 million investment to address homelessness, which um, really went to um, creating that position and staffing the special assistant to end homelessness. Um, this shelter community and some investments in our continuum of care infrastructure and staffing um, and some money to operate the daytime shelter that um, operates in Burlington, the Community Resource Center. And then we, I started the process of, of course, it's a city, you have to procure everything, so go creating RFPs um, for modular shelters and um, and figuring out where this was going to be located. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, the city council approved the, the site, the parking lot, in April. And then we started our permitting process. Um, we needed to get a conditional uh, use approval, so go through the city's DRV. Um, and we needed to get a state water, wastewater permit. So that whole process, um, continuing the design, we started site work in August, um, and you can see, yeah, laid it out of getting all these structures on site, um, and we're able to open in early February. Definitely took longer. I had to go to a lot of city council meetings in here, being like, why isn't it, like, there was a lot of concern, and then once it was underway, like, why isn't it open, which was understandable. That looks quick, actually, when Thank I Thank you. It's hard once it's underway to know that yeah. people are waiting to get shelter and, yeah. and they're not, you, they can't access it. Um, so this was our budget for Alma um, Shelter. These are the sources of funding. So you can see here the total project cost was 1.8 million. The majority of the project came from the city's designated ARPA funds. We had investment from Burlington Electric Department, um, V Light, uh, specifically for the solar panels on the roof. We have some petroleum cleanup funding because we hit an underground storage tank in that whole process. Um, and um, got a grant from the Community Foundation for some of our placemaking. 
Any donations, anything not? Uh, yes, we did receive some donations. Um, we received, um, Sue and I work closely with a company called Minotaur, um, which okay. requires provides mechanical equipment, and we convinced them to donate um, the heating and cooling and ventilation system for the bathhouse. Yeah. Um, and then there was a range of smaller things like yeah. the paint for the site and uh, doormats and things like that. So maybe even if you added 200 grand on there, you're talking 2 million mm, off Much less. I would say donations yeah. didn't get oh, higher than 10 grand. Okay. Yeah. That's much, much lower than I thought. Yeah. Does that include the site cost or is that a? There, yes, yeah. it includes the site. So I'm going to get into the use. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get into the oh, uses. Okay. These are the sources. Yeah. Okay. When we walked on that site, we, you know, it was a really poorly maintained. Yeah, it was a parking lot in bad shape. Yeah. And in some ways, the, the tank helped us. And just for people who are worried, there is going to be a table like this. You're going to see all the costs. But um, this is sort of showing you the big buckets of cost um, and where they are on the site. So doing all that site work um, and the utilities work was just under two hundred thousand dollars. Then we had to do the remediation for the store underground storage tank that we hit that hopefully wouldn't be in anyone else's budget. Um, and then you can see for each of the shelters, accessories, security, um, and then these modular buildings. The six bathrooms came in at just under one hundred and seventy thousand. Community building at one hundred and ninety three. Um, our solar, which was covered by V light, and then this construction management, um, just under half a million dollars. It, this is just, you know, sort of a short list of everything that this company had to do to kind of make it all all work on the site. But that's kind of combined with the site work of, of bringing it all together. Yeah, what the company is it? The company that did that is called Second Gen Builders. Okay. Bob Peters. So you are essentially the developer who covered your cost. And Sue, who covered your costs? Is that Sue, Sue's in here. So yeah. if we go to soft costs, okay. so we put your salary right. up there. Um, uh, so yeah, so my costs are just staff time. Um, yeah. The city happened to hire someone that had the yeah. experience to do this. Yeah. Um, when it wasn't, that was, this was not in my job description when I got home. Yeah, but it's a real value and, and in a sense a Hidden cost of the project. The hidden cost, yeah, it wasn't full time, you know, I so it was about a year of my time, um, you know, maybe 75%, 60%. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this again is just getting you back exactly to that 1.8 million, all of the costs, sorry, so we're in front of you. Um, all of the costs that go into that number. So you said that this project is permitted for three years, and at that point, Either it'll be all packed back onto pallets and moved somewhere else or whatever. Some of these costs, such as the, the bathrooms and all that, are those things also transportable or movable yes. to? Yes. Oh. And that's why I was saying when I started saying we tried to put everything on top of the site, those modular buildings sit on helical piles so they can be picked up and moved to another location. And that was, they were certainly de designed with that intention of being able to use them somewhere else in the city. City would like to convert this site. It is not gonna go back to a parking lot, I promise you, not when I'm alive. Um, <laughs> I, I think the idea is to convert this site to permanent um, affordable housing. Um, and to, you know, I think the hope was like, we're gonna end homeless, right? Like the very like lofty goal was to end, end homelessness in the city of Burlington over these three years. Um, right now, it's certainly worse than it was when we started. There, we still have two and a half years to go. I'm sure that we, there are still people who are going to require shelter. Um, and we, you know, I'm kind of waiting for, to get through the summer before I ask people to start thinking about what comes next because it, it took a lot to get here. Samantha, any of those line items were, became a surprise to you? Something that you went in low and like, wow, you way underestimated the cost of this one. Um, the site. The site. I think the site work combined with the um, construction, you know, like that, yeah, the site with the yeah. construction management is higher than I expected. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm not an expert like you, are. construction management sticks out to me like, is that just a GC you're paying four hundred ninety? million? That was, that, but he did, um, there's a lot of pieces of parts in that. So he good. built, all, he built a, the platforms which, this parking lot is yeah, I mean, slow, yeah, so long as, no, it's yeah. Right. 
maybe better wording, at least for you know, yeah, yeah. looking at it. No, no. Um, Sounds okay. like you're paying a consultant. But consult. he also, if any change yeah. orders that we had on the job came through him, he had to pay yeah. all the, okay, all that's fine. Yeah, mechanical. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot, and I can yeah. provide more detail, but quite a lot of work ended up flowing through him, okay. partially to get around procurement as well, because right. he can just buy things, because yeah. I had procured him, but yeah. I, every time we needed something, working with right. the city, I would need to get I mean, Just your experience it. alone is like yeah. awesome. Right. You know? You had to take on the HVAC contractor and the sure. plumbers and electricians, all that. <coughs> okay, thank you. And this slide is really just to show that, you know, we, I think we kind of came out like, oh, it's like a pretty simple project, it's going to be on top of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, involved. And if you think of, again, of looking at that project, um, the construction management, like all of these subcontractors were under him. So I included all of this. Okay. Work. All the, yeah, there's yeah. All the, and he, I would say, donated an awful lot of weekend time because yeah. I was with him. Because we were there oh, with him. <laughs> yes. Um. Um, so this gets to the site selection. Um, as I said, I know it's kind of um, blurred out, but this is Church Street here. This is City Hall in City Hall Park. I don't know if that helped anyone, but it's just just oh, wow. north. It's very it, it's very much in the downtown. Yeah. Um, the site was we we evaluated ten sites. I worked with city staff, like all across departments, to kind of score ten sites based on what do we own that we don't have to buy or lease from someone else. Um, what's the proximity to transportation and other services? Um, and amenities, you know, open space and, and things like that. So this was the site that was selected. Um, it is within a neighborhood. It, it was quite controversial. We spent a lot of time having community meetings. We had contentious uh, DRB hearings and the amount of time required to sort of um, get the community comfortable enough not to appeal the permit and, and just like make people make people understand or help people understand what it was going to be like was that was a very important thing to consider when you're thinking about the site. When Pallet came to install the shelter today, this is the best site we've ever seen because it's it's integrated into the community. You're not putting people out on the edge and making them take a bus or get a taxi or something to go do all the things that they need to do. So this end. Um, we haven't had any issues with the neighbors, really, um, since it opened. So it's a fear, there was a lot of fear about what it was going to be, um, and it's, it's working out quite well. Um, and this just, brings, again, is more of a reminder of what kind of, even though we're, oh, we're doing this temporary thing, it all sits on top of the site, the required approvals that we had to get at the city of Burlington um, and the permits. And those costs are also included, you know, in those in the soft costs. So you said you had no issues with the neighbors. What sort of outreach did you do? No, we had a lot of issues with the neighbors before, before. it was built. But I'm saying the site is, um, and as you've seen some pictures that we can talk about more, is designed to be a place that people want to be. I think neighbors were very concerned that it was good. people were going to leave it to do some things we weren't allowed on the site or to, you know, be noisy and. There have been some issues in the neighborhood, but it's never the guests of the site. It's people that maybe were trying to get in or trying to get on the list or you know just don't have any other place to go. But the folks that are staying there want to be there. Is it near the Unitarian Church? Yes, it is. Very close to the Unitarian Church. Yeah. You're familiar with that. And we have had, I mean, the, the church area churches have been involved in. Yeah, bringing food. I think one of the church, I don't know if it was Unitarian, someone um, set up like a barbecue in the parking lot one weekend, which was great, and like yeah. served guests and the, you know, that was for the whole neighborhood. And so there's been some great activities. So service providers are coming uh, during business hours during the week? Yes. But are there, is there anybody there um, in the evenings or the weekend hours? Yes, this site is staffed 24 hours a day. The permit requires two staff on site 24 hours a day. So overnight, that's provided by a security company. Um, but during the day, it's provided by Champlain Housing Trust staff and CBOEO staff service providers. And, and there's a line item in the budget that that gets into the operating budget, which is at the very end. Yeah, this is just um, the development of Got the site. It. Okay. 
Um, I've noticed that there's like a real um, a real push towards um, small freestanding buildings rather than like a duplex or row house type setup. Um, and I'm just concerned about like utilities and building costs and things like that. What's the advantage to having freestanding rather than um, you know sharing a roof or walls? Yeah, no, I what you're talking. I think the freestanding when you're thinking about this um, type of shelter, it's really an alternative to congregate shelter, um, to people all being in one room. So building something like row houses or townhouses or you know multifamily. Housing um, is uh, 10, 50 times more expensive. You know, to build a multifamily housing unit right now is five hundred thousand dollars. Oh no, no, I'm not talking about multifamily housing units. I just mean like, um, what's the yes, SRO single residence occupancy? Is that what you're talking about? SROs? No, no. no. Okay. Because um, that would be an alternative. Mm -hmm, right. Um, no, I just mean, um, what's the advantage to not um, sharing any any walls? I think it's like condos. It's like the yeah, co right, it's, yeah. a, it's a cost. This is a cost-effective way yeah. to create new shelter quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think there have been some motels that have been converted to shelters where certainly people are sharing walls and that um, works. But this is a, this was the city found the most cost-effective and and really quick. We were trying to do a rapid response way to be able to um, create shelter that was not congregate, one big room for people. So it's like structural integrity to keep the buildings separate or instead of like a it's, unit? Um, the reason that they're spaced is, is for fire code. Once you have these individual buildings, uh, they're spaced for fire code reasons instead of stacking them all next to each other. Uh, yeah, right. Let me keep, let's keep going and we'll connect at the end if, you, if, it hasn't, if we haven't answered it. Well, I'm just wondering if that isn't part of, um, given that this is not permanent, yeah. and the idea is to be able to move it, that it's way easier to move those things than it would be to move time. that something that had to be deconstructed yeah. and taken piece yeah. by piece. Yep, yeah, that's it's definitely true. pretty constructed and you just assemble it. Right? Yeah, but you have to have a double wide and still move it. I, yeah. I think there's this middle ground. I think what I'm hearing is, so it's a small. Yeah, I'm trying to think of it. I, I just yeah. want to add yeah. that yeah. Right. when I lived in my car, um, privacy was well, uh, yeah. really important. To be able to have your own space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, one of the uh, two things that would drive you know any sane person batty, if not insane, um, is never having privacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was never actually outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I've lived in the woods by choice uh, when I was younger. But um, um, yeah, privacy on yeah. the street. It, it, but, just, and we've heard a lot, of, that's a lot yeah. of the feedback, to have to have a space that's your own. Yeah, um, if you're all packed into one place, the proximity is the key to getting along. <laughs> yeah. Yes, which is still important oh, even in a, on a site, the old commune. A site yes. like this, yeah. yeah. So this is a drawing of the site plan um, that got submitted for our permit. And I just wanted to sort of highlight some of the things that went into creating, like how are we going to create this community on this specific site. Um, there was an existing chain link fence around three sides of the site that um, was left in place. We heard, um, we went to the community resource center to talk with people um, experiencing homelessness or with lived experience to ask them about like, what, what are your thoughts? Like, what can we do here? Um, they talked a lot about security, feeling, being able to feel secure when they were on the site. Um, we had this really great comment, and this got cut off, but one of the guests said, you know, I think we had shelters, we were showing an example where they were clustered, and he said, I like the neighborhoods, but offset the door, like that, getting to that sense of privacy, offset the doors, and he showed us, the community resource center was in the VFW, when he showed us the stars on the flag, and, it, you don't see it as much here, but maybe in another drawing. So that we shifted them all so there the doors are offset. And zoning requirements um, required that we put all the um, utilities underground, all the electrical connections. We had certain setbacks from property lines. We had to screen the trash. 
Um, and the fire marshal uh, required this 14-foot, uh, this yellow strip, and you see it painted in the photos that we kind of incorporated it into our site-wide mural um, emergency access lane so they could get easily, always know they could get an ambulance into the site quickly. Um, and they also required them to be spaced a certain distance from each other. The other big thing that we focus on and how are we going to make this feel like a community and not just a bunch of boxes on a parking lot uh, was you know, something we called placemaking and uh, we worked with the <coughs> architects at Dunham Wisniewski and um, an artist um, to kind of come up with a concept for how we could um, create community on the site, this weaving concept of how do you weave this into the community. Um, covering the asphalt, um, both for visual reasons and for heat effect, heat island effect reasons, um, and making sure we were adding natural materials, um, community <coughs> gathering space, um, and custom art. So we have, there's an artist that lives um, in Burlington that's designed these custom murals that are um, underway right now. She's starting them, and then some of the guests at the site are going to help finish them. So there's going to be um, large panels, art panels that have been created specifically um, for the site using the same um, color palette. All right. So I'm going to now go through the, each of the building types and then we'll, we, we will see a few of the photos. I think a lot of people here are interested in hearing more about um, the pallet shelters. We have 25 of them on site. The reason for this is why 25 and not 30 is like coming in I was like I want to try I want to use this to like what's better like can we do it better at home like and try multiple so I, I wanted to work with a local manufacturer to do something that wasn't flat pack that came from Vermont um, so we, that's why we have two different kinds of shelters I'm not sure if I would do that again <laughs> there's a lot of work and now on the site that's like it's, they're not all the same and that creates Difficulties. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we're learning a lot. This is a learning experience. Um, I'm trying to think. So I think most people know about pallet shelter, um, the cost for the shelter, including transportation, and 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 their crew coming to erect them on the site was just under twelve thousand dollars for shelter. That includes like we're in the super cold climate package or whatever, uh, extreme cold weather package. Um, and it comes with heat and everything else that you need in it. Um, and a, you know, we're adding window AC units. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we ordered five of them to accommodate two people. You could do that with all of them, um, you know, if you wanted. And one of the things I liked when they came was that we had the bases already set. For them the site was laid out exactly where they were going to go in there. The bases we added. Um, for two reasons. One, because the parking lot wasn't flat and we didn't want to mess with, we needed the water to continue to flow to the existing stormwater. Um, but secondly, it, we heard um, from folks in um, Wisconsin that were the first um, people to have a, you know, these in a winter climate that the people were complaining that the floor was cold. So these have insulation and they get the shelters off the ground. Yes. What's the cost differential between a single and a double unit? Just, the, just like getting an extra fold down bunk, which okay. is like so two hundred dollars. So all double units? Um, because double. most of the population we were serving, most of the people, this shelter is for um, chronically unhoused folks that are currently unsheltered. Right. You know, usually you think of as individuals, people who want to be in right. their own space. But the, the point being. Use 30 for individuals and five for couples, but have that flexibility. Oh well, you can move them around. Yeah. They can, they can, you can take them. You can move it around. Oh. So easy, easy to convert it from. They're a, easy one to, to convert. Two. I think I. Yeah. We only have a permit to house to shelter 35 people on the site. Which yes, in uh, in hindsight, I probably would have increased that, but it was a little dicey to get the permit. So. Yeah. Yes. Um, that Amazingly cheap price for yeah. I agree. You know, yeah. And we can see that. And what's the amount of insulation or <coughs> and type of insulation used? Do you know? In the pallet shelters? Yes. And are the walls found? And is that also 
part of soundproofing? Sure. Yeah, so everything is in these panels. I don't remember, I don't have the R, exact R values with me. It's very, it's like astonishingly low and you would be like, ah! And I had uh, several conversations with them where they finally said to me, the person I worked with, doing something is better than doing nothing. And, um, and that's been like kind of a mantra that like, as someone that came from building super highly efficient multifamily housing, I was having this like R value heart attack, and he was like, "That's you know, people are people are unsheltered. Like something is better than nothing." And it was a really important moment for to like keep it moving forward. And we did what we could. I mean, we worked with Efficiency Vermont, building these um, floors had a big influence. You saw one of our sources of funding was Burlington Electric Department. They invested in every energy efficiency upgrade we made above and beyond sort of what the um, building was. So yeah, these panels have the insulation in them. Um, and I like this, you can see at the top, they just, they backed in a truck. We were required to have a forklift, a specific forklift on the site, but their folks um, flew in and they unpacked them on these pallets and they set them up in a day and a half. It all happened, you know, the, from trucks um, to them leaving the site. So as part really, of the 11 8. Yes, as part of the 11 8. Take that all day. Did they have water? No, they, there's no water in these buildings. They have heat and electricity. We have put a mini refrigerator in every unit so that people can store medicine or food. We have food that they have. We, they're not, you're not allowed to have a microwave inside the unit for fire hazard reasons. That's, that's a decision that we have made and that's why we have the community buildings. And Sam, did you furnish it with a bed or shelves? Or it comes, it, it comes with, it comes with beds, yep. And we, um, Part of the 11-8 is a bed? Yes, yes, it's attached to the wall and it folds Wait, there's up. more, oh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Does the community building, like, provide bottom water? Yeah, it does provide bottled water, and there's a actually a water bottle filler um, there. So everyone's when they arrive and they're sort of as part of their check-in process, they get a set of clear bins for their belongings that will fit under the beds, and they get a water, a reusable water bottle, and things like that. But there is bottled water. There's a lot of in that. Yeah. Any other pallet questions? It says the owner supplied window AC units. Yes. How's that working out? I mean, are, are people able to do that? Are they able to provide? We, we, oh, oh we it. provide. Yeah, we oh, included okay. it in our budget. So okay. we're just getting those installed. Okay. I misunderstood. I thought it meant the person living there. No, 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 no. Yeah, sorry. They're not supplied by pallet. But you, okay. but there, this, there's a, you can see this here. Yeah. That, that's designed specifically to take an easy unit. So that's not in the budget? It is in my big picture budget. It's not in this 11. It's in the 1 8, but not. Yeah. That's it. Samantha, are you going to talk about the community buildings and bathrooms and showers and stuff? I am. And I want it. Any other pal questions? So the other five um, shelters that are on the site were constructed by a company called Up and This. They're based in Morris, Johnson, Vermont now, but they started at the generator in Burlington as a startup um, company building modular buildings. And they worked with us to custom design um, a shelter. Um, and I think they're marketing them on their, it's a, a unit you can buy on their website now, not um, for emergency shelter. Um, and these sort of, we worked with Efficiency Vermont and up on this, so these are highly efficient. Um, and they include like an air source heat pump for heating and cooling and have, um, because they're efficient, they also would require to have a ventilation system. Um, and they're made of much more durable um, materials, and you know it's a it's a very different product. You can see it's tw it was twice as expensive. Um, and I, resident, the, what we the feedback that we've heard is they're taller. They're the same footprint on the inside, so they're not bigger, but they look bigger because they're taller. And I think. And in the beginning, there was a little bit of a, like, I want one of those. Some people then said, oh, I don't like, you know, there's been some um, moving around. And we worked really hard to design this um, covered entry, which we were hoping to be able to add to all of the units in some way. But I think it, it's a really, 
important um, component. So I think if you know if you're doing a smaller project, I mean it's a it's a money thing. Um, these are more durable. I think the pallet shelters are they say they're um, warranted for ten years. They're not. It's not a. They're not made of plywood. You know, they're they're a, a panel. Um, these I can imagine easily. You pick them up and like I don't know what we're going to do with them, but they'll be used for a long time. They could be used for shelter or for something else, for a small business on the waterfront, or you know, for some other use. Because they all have windows that in the office locations. What's the size of these units? Sixty-four square feet of all the units. Yeah. Okay, so community buildings, as we said, there was, there's no running water in those um, individual shelters, so we um, added two community <coughs> buildings. This is the first one, a bathhouse, as I was saying, has six full baths, so toilet, sink, shower, two of them, um, ADA, um, and includes the mechanical room for that um, and a utility space. And um, as I said, they were um, designed or built by KBS builders and they came on a truck that was designed specifically like in Vermont, if you're, I forget the inch, like we were shaving inches off to make sure we could um, bring it to the site without police escort in Vermont. Um, so that's, uh, that's good to know. These plans are happy to share for anyone that wants to repeat. Um, and um, some of the work that that construction manager did was this came and got sat on helical piles. We had to build the deck and the ramps to, to on site to actually access each of the bathrooms, um, but it's connected to municipal water and sewer. I'm curious, did you look at other options for uh, bath services? Like, I, I, I am surprised to see each of them as a full unit. So I'm thinking, like, what's in a stadium, you have a bunch of urinals, a bunch of toilets. Not everybody's going to need a shower at the same time. So if someone's in the shower, they're occupying the sink and the toilet. Yeah. Well, people are like, come on, finish with the shower. So yes. That's where I was thinking, like, have shower yeah. facilities separate from toiletry facilities as I, an option. Yeah, I think we wanted to, this was the most efficient layout we could get to. We wanted to be able to provide six showers. Um, and we didn't spend a lot of time looking yeah, you at it. Yeah, you got to plug and play. You got pulled, pulled apart. Yeah. Um, there are two additional um, bathrooms in the community building that that are just okay. um, bathrooms. But right. yeah, Thank and you. I haven't heard that it's been an issue yeah. um, with people waiting. I think it's more in the winter the you have to travel to it. But it seems like it's a little more like home, though. I think people feel good to be in a bathroom. It's like yeah, a, yeah it's a very like residential scale yeah. bathroom. Yeah. Um, and then in the community building, as I said, there's two offices. Um, this waiting room is where um, people come into the building and check in with staff. Um, the kitchen's labeled as break room for code reasons. <laughs> um, there's um, two bathrooms, uh, laundry, two sets of washers and dryers um, that are very heavily utilized, uh, the mechanical room, and then this large um, open space that I have a um, picture of y'all see where people are there's a pass through from the kitchen so people are served food and just have space to hang out yeah what are the size of the washer dryers and are they industrial they're not regular commercial they're commercial but not industrial and we have um, work with fishes in Vermont so we have one stackable like heat source the site is all electric there's no um, no fossil fuels on the site. Um, we have a, one set that's a stackable like heat pump washer and dryer, and then a, a standard ex ADA accessible a commercial washer and dryer. Yeah. Is there like a uh, oven, stove, hot plate, anything where people can cook? <coughs> Just microwaves. I mean, there is on the set, there is the kitchen is a full kitchen, um, partially because I imagine that in the future this might actually become a home, you know, be, become someone's home. Um, but there is several, it's mostly, you can heat up food in a microwave. Okay, so people aren't allowed to use the... Not to use the kitchen, no. Okay. 
Is that the people like, can't use the kitchen at all? No, not the guests. They can only they can heat up food. There's so who uses the kitchen? The staff does. Um, passes out food. Uh, being able to have guests use the kitchen besides like maintain like how you maintain cleanliness and things like that um, we would have had to have like a whole fire a, a really expensive fire suppression system that just we couldn't it didn't make sense in the budget operationally that would have been real yeah I think operationally given the um, so, community yeah so is the kitchen sufficient that congregate meals can be served all the food, the food actually comes from feeding Chittenden, delivers um, meals that are ready to be heated up. Okay. Oh, wow. So they're not cooking so it's on not site. actually meals a functioning wheels. kitchen. It's like right. meals on wheels. Yep. But it's not actually a functioning commercial kitchen. It's not, it's not a commercial kitchen, exactly, because we could not afford a commercial kitchen. Okay. So do all your guests come eat here? Yes. Okay. Nice. Um, uh, you know, hibachis outdoors, um, possible. Or what? Um, uh, barbecue. I know, we, I'm working at Mass and the Fire Marshal, but I haven't got <laughs> not, not right now. I, I know another way had a, uh, or maybe still has a functioning kitchen for over 20 years for unhoused people. Are the codes just different? For Washington County than Chittenden? Um, it's possible that it was grandfathered in. I think um, this project had so much scrutiny. Um, and yeah, so I think it was probably a combination of this. So I, that's great. And like, don't don't tell the folks. Don't think about certain people who do the cooking here, but I may be wrong. I don't know if any of you have been cooking here. There's two kitchens. Guests are allowed to cook at our shop. Yeah. I'm the very one that you know. We have two kitchens. Don't tell your what did she say? He's yeah. saying so that at their shelters. At the Welcome Center in Berlin, there are two kitchens, and guests are do their own cooking. Yeah. Another way has two kitchens. One is a commercial, and then one is for the get for the residents or people who use the drop-in. Mm -hmm. um, I think, as I mentioned previously, um, in terms of making sure, like trying to uh, keep the community engaged and it was really about providing information and helping address um, fear. We had a lot of the, the farthest column is community meetings we had um, before um, the shelter was opened. Uh, we also, the city maintained a website to kept uh, information up to date, translated our, you know, the facts into the top 10 languages. We had um, community days where we um, invited folks onto the site to help paint the site-wide mural. Um, and there's ongoing uh, monthly meetings that are um, a community group that is uh, comprised of service providers, guests, and neighbor members of the neighboring community to talk about opportunities, challenges, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, are are um, families um, able to to live in these um, boxes? Not for not for ch no one under eighteen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, I think that it's not. It's we determined that it was really not suitable. This kind of shelter not suitable for children. Sixty-four square feet. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is a sort of looking at overview of um, the first timeline I showed you was kind of from conception to opening. This was the actual construction. I think Sue called this out like this was just like my angst of like those buildings from KBS, like they didn't come when we thought they were going to. And so that delayed us. And here it doesn't look like such a big deal, but it was a, it was a, long, it was a long eight weeks. Um, but you can see from the second week of August to the first week of February is what it took to do all that work, including hitting an underground tank and having to remediate soil. And we had to read it and all of a sudden, it was. So the underground tank was a surprise. You didn't know it was there. Yeah, you hit it. Yeah, on our last day, connecting the water line. It was oil or something. All the way. Turn it down. Oh, everywhere. It was just it. Random old oil tank? Yes, They're everywhere. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. everywhere. So this was my kind of highlights of lessons learned. I don't know, Sue, if you want to 
add anything to this? I mean, lessons learned was just having the, out of all the credit goes to Samantha, because she had the vision and the guts to do this, you know, and, and to stand up there and, and talk in front of communities who really were against me. I mean, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. You have to. Some of the lessons for us was thinking, you know, working on the builder, we ended up working with KBS Builders, and it took a long time. So there might be some other lo local options that might be quicker, um, might have been quicker at that point. We're all like, we should have just think about this, it would have been quicker. You know, so <laughs> thinking about how to do that. Yeah. How do you think of the board for $2 a day? That seems cool. Well, that is actually quite, when some of us know our value, it's about $10 a day to run an electric resistance heater. For That's per shelter. So it's an electric heater. It works. That's what I'll say. I think that my biggest fear was like, is it going to work in, we're certainly the coldest climate that these have been installed in. I had the chance you know, to talk with folks in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, who are living through it and you know we're guessing the floor is cold but like people it's it's warm enough it works mm -hmm. um so just uh, just reiterating we had very very cold weather while um while these were operating and the heater as it works as pallet claims mm -hmm. yeah the temperature inside 50 degrees approximately no no it's oh i mean it's hot it, 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 oh i mean it goes up to 80 on the body yeah, your body puts off heat. I think Hal says they can keep it 90 degrees above the coldest temperature or 70 degrees. It's, it was warm. It was warm even below zero. Did you have the figure for the, the five um, up in this? The operating costs? I yeah. don't because I, I mean, this, we're working actually, I just met Efficiency Vermont on site this week to um, put some E gauges on the electrical panel and try and dig down into our usage information. I have this number because one of our panels just has, pa has pallet shelters on it, so I can. it's very easy to do the math, but the up end, this ones are, are mixed in, but we will have that information. Well, not for, not for the winter, not for another year. Sorry. Thank you. Well, keeping it cool will be an issue too. Yes, exactly, running those air conditioners. I just, when I'm on site, I say, please, Make sure you don't have your heat and your air conditioner on. <laughs> but so is the heater built into the? It is built into the pallet shelter. So it's not a little box or something. No, no. I mean, it is the same concept, but it's a te it's part of the building. Um, Can people got, control the heat? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And That's great. I can't do that in my apartment. <laughs> I know. There are pets, which I think we get to. So this was the part that Sarah Russell um, was going to do. I do not have a background in homelessness or social work or um, services, so it, definitely not my area of expertise, but I'm going to do my best. I, she and I sit very close to each other. I'm pretty, I know pretty much everything that's <laughs> happening. Um, this is the inside of the um, community. This photo is, is from the inside of the community building, sort of looking out from the kitchen out into the open space. So you can see there's lots, there's always food available. You can see the microwaves um, over in the corner for heating up meals. There's always coffee available. Um, and this space is open um, from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. And then um, it does, when, when it's just security on site and not staff, um, this space is not open. But they, I think the waiting room is open. The waiting room is open and there's like a microwave that gets set up in the waiting room. Um, so you keep track of how many people are in there or they can only have a certain amount? Uh, no, everyone can, there's enough space for everyone to be in here. At the there's, same time? Yes, yep, it's pretty big space. But there's security, so you have to buzz in to get into the site. You know, yeah, the site kind of is a fully secured site, so we didn't um, talk a lot about that, but I, at the beginning I said there was a chain link fence that already secured three sides, and then across the front, I don't want to go all the way back, but we can, um, there's a new cedar fence that was put up um, that creates privacy uh, within the site, and it has uh, gates for emergency access, um, and then it has a pedestrian gate that's locked, and so ever with a camera on it. So anytime someone enters a site, they you have to hit a, a doorbell, and the staff looks to see who it is, 
um, and that's for the security of the staff, it's for security of guests on site, um, and they're keeping track of, and the, you have to hit a, a doorbell to leave as well. So they are keeping track for safety reasons, to also to know who's on the site. Um, and, and only guests are allowed um, inside the site. They can have, the guests can have guests in, um, in the community space, but not inside the site, and that's for the security of others. Um, so the uh, operations team, the city hired um, Champlain Housing Trust, to with, uh, has lots of experience. Um, so we're very lucky to operate the site. Um, and um, community service coordinators um, come through from Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. So it's social workers, case workers, um, on site uh, every day, seven days a week. And then through, um, memorandums of understanding these are the other service providers that are on the site on a regular basis um, during the during the week and we I mean we heard a lot when we were designing this and sort of moving towards this that a lot of this population is service resistant there's not a requirement um, to uh, accept services or work with service providers but we heard um, from folks who have been offering similar style shelter communities that after seeing the same people for two, three, maybe four weeks and feelings, realizing that you were safe, people started to be open to connecting with service providers and that has certainly started to happen here. Is, is the VNA in there at all? Um, not, we don't question? have the VNA. We have the Community Health Services of Burlington. Um, comes on site. But so the nursing well, what staff. happens if somebody gets sick? Do they just leave? <laughs> um, it depends. So we have uh, nursing staff that comes on site from the community um, health services of Burlington, okay, the yeah. community health center, or people can you know go leave, go to the emergency room, go to the doctor. So <clears throat> this is the annual operating budget that um, we just submitted to the state. The majority, I don't have a sources, but the majority of the operating funds do come from the state HOP. I don't even know what HOP stands for because this isn't. Housing Opportunity Program. Thank you. <laughs> um, this has not been funded yet. Um, we do have in that um, original uh, $3 million of ARPA that the city designated some of that is to help support the operations of the site. It's much more expensive than we were anticipating because when Champlain Housing Trust got involved, they said there, we need more robust staff than, than you were anticipating. So <coughs> it is costing just uh, about you know $1.3 million a year uh, to, to operate this site. Utilities that, that includes utilities. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I'm looking at the number for staffing, and I see the number of people mm -hmm. that are that's broken out, and then I'm looking at security. Mm -hmm. and we're seeing two positions. Mm -hmm. Is that does that represent just a hugely different rate for those people, or is it the number of hours? It's a combination of things. Okay. So the security is overnight. I think they start at. Is that a private firm? That yes. Contract yeah. with? Yep. And Shepard has just did not want to provide overnight staff, so it's contracted with a private firm. And they're, the, they're the only ones that are on site overnight. Yes. There's no other staff. Or no, the staff from Shepard has There is always a staff person on call. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, that they get called. How has that been working for the people um, who live there? That's a good question. I have not had a chance to ask the folks who live there. The site has been operating pretty smoothly. Uh -huh. um, so I think it's working. I think the city's preference would be that there was overnight staff, but our preference was also to have Champlain Housing Trust operate the site. So this was a uh, give and take. So the operating costs or the FTEs, it's all outsourced. There's no city. There's this labor. is no city staff here. Yeah. So these are uh, this is actually the custodial support is someone um, that was hired through the parks department that manages all the facilities at the city. But all of these positions are Champlain Housing Trust staff. Um, yeah. 
So looking at the budget, the security is probably two shifts plus weekends, right? Yeah, it's 20, yeah, it's seven days a week. So, but so, are, are the, the security the only staff there all day and night on the weekends? No, it's just overnight. There's always okay. um, CHT staff during the day. I'm just curious, the, the 30,000 for cleaning, that's not for staffing uh, for a cleaner. Um, what does that cover? Um, this is not my budget, uh, so I don't know the details. I think a lot of trash cleaning, now trash is its own oh, so line yeah. item. Um, I think what this includes that hasn't happened yet is to get cleaning to happen on the weekend because this uh, staff person, so this is our budget, this is our FY24 budget, um, is to be able to pay someone to come in on the weekend because the bathrooms right now don't get clean on the weekend. Um, and just, uh, it also is there includes an RFP like for that? all of the toilet paper and soap dispensers and paper towel, you know, all of the kind of um, materials that are used. Yeah, okay. Well, it's a good question though, it's a high number, I'll ask. And, uh, who or what is the managing partner? Champlain Housing Trust. So that's their overhead administrative cost, the, the 87, no, 87 thousand. Oh, sorry, no, that's us, that's the city. That's oh. our overhead cost. Okay. So that, um, we have two staff people, Sarah Russell and uh, Marcel again, another person who are sort of managing all of these pieces. And all of, like all of this money has to flow through our office. I'm, I'm just noticing in the background, like the raised bed there, is that yes. just for landscaping or is there like actually some kind of community garden? There's spot? community gardens, yes, they're happening, I know. I'm going to buy the plants tomorrow. Yes, yeah, they are filled now. So. They have dirt in them, I know, it's been a, pro it's been a process. Are people like excited to do that? Um, you know what? We, the site manager was like trying to put up, she put up a sign to like start a garden club. She said no one came. But when I was on site, I went on site and I had to line all these things with fabric and we moved the dirt. Like people, I think people will be, we just need to get the stuff there. I'm sorry, that just brings up another question. How long do, is, is there a time limit for people to be able to stay? Um, the, so our um, zoning requirements for emergency shelter limit a stay to 180 days with an option to extend for 90 days. Um, we think because these are all individual shelters, just moving maybe from one shelter to another if someone needs to stay longer. It's oh, gonna, cool. yeah. <laughs> this is no one is being No one's watching. Yes. Important. Sorry. Go ahead. Have you had turnover? Have you had people move on? Yes. I'm getting that. Okay. I wanted. There were other questions. I wanted before I go off the budget. Yes. Okay. So I just figured did the figuring, and that comes out to about forty-seven thousand dollars per person. So well, it's not per them. person, maybe per shelter. Per shelter. Well, if you have 30 shelters. Yeah. Yep. We have 25 shelters. The 30, 30 shelters. shelters. Okay, per shelter. I can tell you, and again, I'm sorry, Sarah's not here. It's very, it's basically equivalent to a motel night. The cost per person is equivalent to a motel night, but it includes all of these services on site and all of the food and things like that. Uh, cost equivalent to, to, for a hotel night? For what the sit for what the okay. state pays the state, themselves? Yes. Or the state. The so, state. The hundred and fifty dollars. So up, up to five up to eight thousand a month? Not not that number. Right? Yeah, the, well it's about hundred and fifty dollars a night, I think. Okay, Again, this is not my I'm outside my um, expertise zone, but I think it's about hundred and fifty dollars a night and this is pretty as close. Yep. Yes. Uh, I'm just learning about this. So if there it sounds like it's a short stay, 180 days, with the possibility, I don't know, I'm not doing the math in my head. Yeah. You're doing a wonderful yes. job, by the way. Thank I you. This is great. Um, I would say, if it is possible for the people who stay there to become part of the cleaning crew of the bathroom stay on the weekend. Yeah. I think we're, we're um, that, question is being um, considered. I think it's been a, it was a huge deal to get it open. The biggest thing that is, people are focused on is safety um, of staff and of guests and like those kinds of things are evolving. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did, was there another budget question? Before? I can't really. Um, 
Um, so this is very early data. The data we have is just for this, you know, the first quarter of the year. So just through uh, March 31st, so the first 51 days that the shelter operated, the total number of people that were sheltered in that 51 days was 37. It was a staggered start. So CHG, the first week, there were five guests. For the first, you know, they did, they welcomed five guests at a time because that staff literally, like, we were like, they couldn't get in because we were still painting and stuff. <laughs> and, and then once we could, it was February, and we needed to start letting people shelter. So they did a staggered start of five people <coughs> every two, two to three days. Um, so 37 people um, were there in those 51 days. You can see 28 of those folks chose to connect with case management. There were two referrals to specific mental health services, two referrals to substance use disorder treatment, or three. Um, one uh, referral to the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, referral to legal services, and three referrals for employment, education, and training. So those are people, that's what those folks were. Once they connected with the case manager, um, those were the kinds of services that they were looking to be connected with. In those first 51 days, we had two people exit to permanent housing, which is amazing. This is chronically homeless um, population people who have been living outside, so that was really exciting. Uh, one person exited to a substance abuse treatment facility. Three people just left because they, it, the environment didn't work for them. And then there were eight involuntary exits. So this is a low um, barrier shelter, which we're gonna get to on the next um, slide, talk a little bit more about that. But there are some rules, again, about that safety um, issue. So if there's violence, um, that, then you have an involuntary exit. And then that wait list. This, is, this was the wait list yesterday, yeah. 136 wow. people actively trying to access the shelter. Just, What's your churn rate, roughly? Um, well, you can see here, in the first 51 days, 10 people exited. I don't know, it's just coming to somebody in that. Ten, ten people have been doing this. But then immediately filled up. So oh, yeah, that because there's a waiting list. So that's like 20%. I might just not be understanding that, but if, if ten people left mm -hmm. and there's 30. Why was it only 37? Yeah. It was that staggered start. So oh, I, I think because this is just the super, hopefully the second quarter data will be like, it started at 30, there were 35 people there when it started and 35 people when it ended. But because like, so the first week there was only five people there and the second week there were 10. So that's good, good catch. Another question. Yeah. Were all the people um, Burlington residents? Um, before, or were there people from out of the city, out of the state? No, I think so. The referral team, I'm hoping it's on these slides. I haven't even looked at these because Sarah was going to do them. But um, the, there's, a, there's a referral team made up of service providers and street outreach workers and Sarah. And, um, so yeah, it's all people who are currently within sheltering within city limits or not unsheltered within city limits. So there's not people on the wait list from Montpelier. It's all folks that are in Burlington. Okay, so these are Sarah's lessons learned. I think really important, the low um, barrier model um, to ensure like why even with the motel system open and all these other things, why are people still unsheltered? So assessing um, why they haven't um, accessed emergency shelter and figuring out how to make it um, work for them, allowing um, couples to stay in one shelter has been important. 24 seven access, you get your shelter, you get a key, you put your stuff in there and you come and go whenever you want. Um, that's very unusual in a lot of the shelter um, setups. There are pets allowed on site. Um, there's a few small dogs. Um, they don't, you, there's not like a bag check. Um, services are encouraged but not required. Um, person center approach to behavioral guidelines and challenges um, and embracing a restorative approach. Um, this staff works very closely with the Community Justice Center um, in Burlington to use a restorative uh, approach when possible um, and prioritizing access for, for folks who are currently unsheltered. <coughs> she had a second one. Um, and this, 
this first bullet is what I was referring to, that there's a community-based referral team. So um, from the Continuum of Care and the Chinook County Homeless Alliance, those folks are all working together to create the list of and, and prioritization. Um, we have continuous communication many, many times a day with on-site management, um, being ready to change. This was true in the development process and it's true in the operations. Like, we are figuring it, or we're building the airplane as we're flying. No one has done this before, <laughs> the people that are working on it. So being able to, to change um, is really important. Um, engaging people with lived experience and the neighborhood in planning discussions. Um, and then formalizing the partnerships with all the services and resources that are available on site and making sure people can get what they need on site so they don't have to leave if they don't. Yes. Did you have people? Uh, did you have people with lived experience involved at, at every step in the process in terms of the design, the policy making, the decision? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, in developing the policy, the operations policy, absolutely. No, yeah. no, but I'm talking about the whole. I would process. say not until no, not until. I mean, certainly in our site design mm -hmm. we did, and then in all of the operation policies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it seems like it's no. pretty no. critical to have somebody who's focused 100% on this at the city level? Um, I think, yeah, different communities have done different things. I think, as I said, it was a little bit of luck that I, I was hired, I didn't, my workload hadn't been determined and I had development experience in terms of getting it set up. I think you could hire a consultant, but someone has to be, someone's really got to drive it. It's not yeah. going to build itself and continuing to have a point person at the city. Um, if you're using, especially if you're using city, re for us, like when you're using city resources, when we, as an employee of the city, every citizen of the Burlington is my boss, and I am required to answer any question um, that they ask, really. And that's part of, you know, I'm a public servant. So when you're using um, city resources, it, it requires a different level of engagement. If you're not using city resources, um, I would say you wouldn't, you don't have to do like that. Okay. Yeah. So I think you may have mentioned it up front about the temporary nature of this. And throughout the program, you're saying about how we could repurpose these later on. Mm -hmm. So what's the life span of this project that you did? So this project has a, right now has a three year lifespan. Okay. And it, I don't, I don't know yet. Does like, that mean it's funded for three years and it gets um, up for The renewal? operating funding is annual, so okay. um, I mean, if we... So, so the three years was determined based on what? Yeah, um, it was based on the mayor's desire to end homelessness in three years, and it was part of a permitting strategy, quite honestly. Um, so it was based on, it was political. I think you said you struggled to get the permit in three years was about it. Well, that, I mean, I don't, I don't know that, I think, I don't know the temp, if the temporariness had anything to do with it, but just like yeah. how much work we had to do. We were saying, this is, yeah. this is a temporary facility where this is going to be here forever. Like that and you hate to. Yeah. Yeah, I'll come back next summer. year and I'll tell you what's going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> I want to go to the back first because you're being nice and quiet. Has there <laughs> been any efforts to secure? Any private funding given that vast wealth that's in Chicago right now? I mean, a million dollars is chump change for some people, let's face it. That's yeah. true. Um, we haven't had to do that yet. I mean, I think we, um, you know, we have used ARPA funding and the state has shelter funding available and that, that's working right now. Yeah. What's the total square footage of the of the site? The footprint of the site. I'm gonna go all the way back. Six of an acre. Like about half, a little over half an acre. Yeah. Someone was yeah. really paying yeah. attention. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Point five four acres. Which is in feet for those of us who. Oh. About hundred. I think it's like hundred by two hundred and fifty or something. Acres two hundred nine by two hundred nine. It's like a really big basketball court. Yeah. Like, and this is Elm Street, Elm, Elmwood, Elmwood Avenue. Avenue. It's, yeah, you're sort of standing on Elmwood Avenue. Yeah. Um, given the, the, 
crisis, I guess I can use that word, that, it, you know, with the end of the hotel program. Um, do you think that there's any interest, will, or possibility of creating more sites like this within Chittenden County, or? Um, I haven't is heard it? any. The Burlington's proposal is sort of on the request of the state is for congregate shelter for individuals. And there's a different plan for the vulnerable population, but not more of this. Could I, I have a comment related to your question. We operate three shelters. Uh, one of our shelters is, um, they're doubles. They're, they're larger than these units and they are connected. Like they're in a bit, one building. Uh, two buildings. Two buildings, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and there are refrigerators, mm -hmm. and then there's a common kitchen and lounge area and so forth. The state is paying us, well, while our operating costs is 60. 10 minutes, is, okay. Is $60, $60 a night. Okay. And our shelters range between about uh, 60 and 70 per bed per night. Mm -hmm. And they are pushing back on us. Mm -hmm. Push back on them. Yeah. Well, we're trying to. <laughs> you can take I think this budget. is great. I think yeah. this is fantastic. Yeah. But I look at, and they should be giving this project that much money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, it, I wonder if there is enough commitment to do this at this level in other locations. Mm -hmm. Because our experience is they're not even giving us enough money to run it. As it is. At yeah. seventy dollars a night. I think some of this, honestly, I don't know if people were following it, but the city had, had a very challenging time yeah. trying to get someone to operate the site, and there yeah. was a very uncomfortable meeting between the city and the state and Champlain Housing Trust and other providers in Chittenden County. That there was a lot of pressure put on Champlain Housing Trust to step into this role, yeah. and they have kind of said, "This is what it costs for us to do it," and they're doing a phenomenal job. And they were, this is what it costs for them to, this is sort of what it costs for them to do it. So there, I think it's, it, it's a very specific situation. The state really wanted to see, wanted to see how does this model work and at this public health model with all the services, like, is it, is it working? And I don't, unfortunately I didn't have, like, there's been a lot of, a lot of successes that didn't show up in that data, even in the, you know, in the last couple of months. So. St. Johnsbury, I think, looked at, at this and, and has backed away for now. And Upper Valley will ultimately be looking at this down the road. Yeah. So I know we now have eight minutes. <laughs> I'm just, we, we need to let the library close. I want to go, I'm going to go back to this last slide so people can write down um, my email. <laughs> S <laughs> <laughs> done. S done at BurlingtonDT.gov. Oh, did it shut? Is, is it because the library is closing? I think they kicked us out. Or I just covered it. Oh my gosh. Yes. So what was it? S. S done. S done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. at BurlingtonDT.gov. And um. I am happy to answer questions over email. If you email me, I can send you this presentation as a PDF. Um, Sue and I put a lot into figuring this out and would want to make sure that we share, um, share any information that we can and help other people uh, try it. It's, it's, it's worth it. You did a um, great job. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. But um, being on the site, um, just you know, I'm often on the site just you know dealing with something's not working Everything. or with efficiency from on or the garden bed still um, but to get to be there with people who really have been unsheltered for very many for a very long time to see them this is their place they're there with their dog I see them they're knocking on they're walking across and knocking on their friend's door and it's, it's creating um, community and security and dignity that everyone um, deserves to have. So it's it's absolutely worth all the hard work. Mm -hmm. one, of yeah. them, one of the guys, I, just my neighbor who's plugged into this site, he said, I saw Mike the other day and he went crazy and he's been sleeping every yeah, He's not sleeping with one eye. I mean, it's just like, who? Mm, you should realize.
So, Amanda, do you have an idea when the next round of data will be available? Because I would imagine that's going to be quite revealing. Yeah, it's it's quarterly data, so June, at the end so of maybe, June, so, so, so mid-July, probably. July. Yeah, okay. we'll have it available. Okay, that would be I, great. I first learned about this company about 2019. I did write the governor about it at some point. And um, also a good thing about this company is, or the, the pallet, I don't know about the other one, is I think in the, at the Washington factory, they have a lot of people who were homeless. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's part of their, it's, it's integral to what they're doing. It's mm -hmm. a And I, I really believe in this, and I've been trying to promote it in ways around here. Yeah, it's a great thing. And I'm really interested in any follow-up that comes that comes down from people who have who have been there, yeah. how they feel about it. And I think I think it's a great thing because for what you're getting with all that services that they can get and start to move on and feel yeah. better. Yeah, and it's certainly it's not gonna be it's not gonna be a success story for everyone um, that goes in there, but but there's a lot of success, and to me, if even one person is able to get uh, what they need, it's worth it. And we're, yeah, we're seeing that over and over. Someone just left for their first job, right? They yes, they got hired while they were at um, the shelter, and for a while, the, the employer was picking them up. And then they got enough money, and they got an apartment. They're actually living in Montpelier, where their child is living. And so, yeah, it's this, they just needed. Stability. Yeah. And the, the three years that like gets your foot in the door and then you can show that it's being successful. It's not like you absolutely have to be out in three years, right? That's correct. That's good. Well, you pick it up and move it to a new location. And do they have a mailing address? They do have they do have a mailing address, yeah. We have a lot of parking lots available here in Montpelier, so if you're looking for a parking lot to put I'm not looking for anything. <laughs> There are a lot of parking lots in Montpelier, but the, most of them are not available because they're state yeah. lots. So that's, they're two different issues. So yeah, yeah. Well, let's not go there. I, want, I, I, I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I